All right, well, thank you guys for uh, coming to what like the second to last session of the day. Uh, really appreciate it. So today we're gonna try and do uh, a kind of in-depth, uh, deeper dive across the Helm ecosystem. So uh, we're gonna cover a lot of material kind of very quickly up front, and then we're gonna switch and kind of cover some of the Helm 3 stuff in detail. And then at the end, we have plenty of time reserved for, uh, what are we officially calling it? Just Q&A? Q&A. Got a whole bunch of core maintainers heckling us from the front row. So if anything flies up from the front row, please don't follow suit. Just let them feel awkward and alone. Uh, all right, so, <laughs> so uh, let's start out by just talking about the Helm organization as a whole. So early this year, uh, Helm was promoted out of the Kubernetes project and up into a top-level CNCF organization. Brian Grant uh, was our uh, was our kind of mentor through that whole process. Everything went very, very well, and we were very excited uh, to uh, to kind of get promoted through that particular uh, rigmarole. We started then with a giant checklist of things that had to be done, and these things went all over the place from you know, transferring domain names from one place to another and, 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 and uh, you know, clearing logos past copyright and things like that through uh, modifying, switching from a CLA to a DCO. Uh, so we've, we've gone through this entire checklist and we have just about reached the very end of it. So the way the Helm org is gonna be structured here, as you probably already noticed, is Helm will be a top level umbrella organization and will have ver and has various sub projects within it, one of which is Helm the tool, uh, others of which are the charts repository, monocular, chart museum, and others. And the plan is for us to have this kind of home for other Helm related projects as the Helm ecosystem continues to grow and we have a kind of lightweight documented process for what it takes for a project to join the Helm eco to join the Helm organization and also uh, you know, how we govern projects and, and uh, where we draw the lines between uh, what the project governs on their own and what the Helm organization kind of adds on top of that. As some of you have, have asked, right, uh, there's a process in CNCF where some projects come in at a sandbox stage, others come in at an incubator stage, and, and they progress all the way up to graduated state, what's the official name of a graduated project? <laughs> to a graduated project. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, people have asked us when we plan on graduating. We are actually not really, uh, we haven't chosen that as a focal point right now. Uh, what we've decided is that we want to spend the first year or two as an, or as an organization just trying to make sure that the projects that we have are, are progressing uh, along, the, along the, uh, the trajectory that we want them to. And so at some point we will, uh, you know, maybe, in, maybe around this time next year, we'll start talking about what would it take for us to graduate uh, out, of the, out of the incubation stage, but it's not something we're worried about right now. Okay, and then finally, one of the big things that we had to do in order to become a CNCF project is we had to put in place our governance model. So we do officially have a governance model now. So uh, we have the Helm organization has a, a group of what we call org maintainers, and the org maintainers are responsible for, uh, for handling the, the details of the organization. So uh, we talk to CNCF once a month and do our check-in with them. Uh, we work on uh, you know, accepting new projects into the Helm org, things like that. And then each individual project retains its own set of core maintainers, and those core maintainers are the decision makers for their project. Uh, we have like a little lightweight charter about what happens if two sub-projects disagree and how the org maintainers would, would help facilitate, but we've never had to do anything like that. So largely, it, it's, it's more like a formal role. Um, so I, I think that, that kind of covers the gist of what we have organization-wide, uh, but we are working actively on doing another Helm Summit. How many people in here were in the first Helm Summit in Portland? It was a, that's, a, wow, I, it was a very small event intentionally, um, and I'm glad you guys are here today. Uh, we are going to do one next year in Europe. Uh, we're targeting around the April-May time frame. It will not be a co-located, well, it's currently uh, slated to not be co-located with a KubeCon. It'll be a, a standalone event, and again, we'll try and target a fairly 
a small audience. We're not going to try and you know double or triple the size. But the idea is to kind of figure out how we can do it so that we can have smaller groups of people who can get together in one or two different rooms and talk about how they're, how they're deploying Helm in their organizations, what kind of pain points they have, what kinds of features they'd like to see in Helm or Chart Museum or Monocular or anything like that. So that's all planning. All right, so let's dive in more on the technical side of things. So we've gotten to the point where now we're talking about Helm uh, tooling in kind of two separate categories. One of them is sort of the chart half of the ecosystem and the other one is kind of the Helm proper half of the ecosystem. So I'm going to start out with charts, and then we're going to kind of, uh, as we, we'll progress through that material fairly quickly, and then get on and talk about Helm, Helm 2, and Helm 3. So uh, the chart maintainers have, been, have, have experienced some um, uh, frustrations recently. Uh, and, and I know many people who have contributed to the charts repository have, have, have experienced frustration. Uh, I, I know of chart PRs that have sat in the queue for six weeks or so before getting, uh, before getting reviewed and then getting merged in. That's a long time. But the, the, the problem is it's that the chart maintainers, almost all of whom do this at, on a purely voluntary basis, just have so much material to go through that they, they're just overwhelmed. Uh, for a while, we had a couple chart maintainers that were turning over after only a couple months in the role, and that's a really strong indicator that people are getting burned out too fast. Consequently, the process is probably broken. Yeah, who here is a chart maintainer? And who here has ever contributed to any of the charts in Incubator or Stable? All right, so anyone with their hands up now, um, those previous people, like go up and give them a cuddle. <laughs> but uh, ask first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I think it's in the uh, the code of conduct. How about a high five? A oh, high five. That's that's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, so we kind of set out intentionally trying to focus the effort on the chart side, uh, with building a set of tools that were going to help make the chart maintainers' lives a lot easier. And so we started down a path by basically taking tools that already existed there and trying to put some momentum behind those tools. The first one is Chart Museum. Did I get the number right? 08 is the right, yeah, is currently the, uh, the right one. So the point of Chart Museum was to provide a, an official tool inside of the Helm repo. Uh, Josh, by the way, who's the, who started the project is sitting here in the front row and will be up here, or will be answering questions during the Q&A whether he likes it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the idea was we wanted something in the official Helm project that provided a kind of high-grade uh, chart repository uh, implementation. And they've been working on that uh, f for the last year plus, uh, just working on trying to meet the kinds of needs that, uh, that enterprises have and meet the kind of usability requirements that users have. And it's really matured as a project. The second project is called Monocular. So Monocular, we started quite a while back as a way to kind of provide a UI on top of a chart repository. And <coughs> it, it progressed quite well. Uh, Bitnami, who had, been, who had basically shepherded the project since we very first started it, actually took it as the basis of their excellent KubeApps product. Uh, but then we kind of let it go just because everybody got busy doing other things. And as we started talking about the chart maintainership stuff, we got some momentum behind it again. And the people who worked on that project pushed it all the way through to a 1.0. And what's exciting about that is then after doing that, they began working on the new hub.helm.sh. Try saying that one 10 times fast. <laughs> which is the new home for charts. And it's based on mon monocular. Bitnami has done a fantastic job of contributing to this along with several other uh, companies who actually allocated fixed developer hours to getting everything going. And the, the exciting part for us is that we have, uh, by adopting this and making this an official part of Helm, this hub.helm.sh, we've committed to kind of raising the findability bar for charts. So you can go out there, you can search through something visually, you can quickly click through the different things, read the notes on it, find out where the repository is hosted, uh, and then run a Helm install and get that installed. Uh, I think, as you can see, if you can see over on the uh, left-hand side there, we already have several repositories plugged in. This is the big deal for us. In order to have this transform into lower maintainership requirements, we needed a way to allow other people to take their repositories and, and hook them into the, the Helm Hub. That is possible now. I think by pull request is the way we're asking people to, to request uh, being added onto this list. But at this point, 
Uh, we can add a new repository. The charts that are in that repository become immediately searchable. And then when your repository makes it in the official one, it, the experience feels a little more like, say, uh, like NPM or something like that, where you can cruise through, find the things you want, and go from there. So uh, one last thing that I wanted to make sure uh, we made clear. Uh, Josh asked me to make this clear, and so I made the dopiest looking happy face slide I could do, which was not hard given my PowerPoint skills, or lack thereof. Uh, just to make it clear, Monocular is a front-end tool designed for discoverability. It is not a repository server. A chart Museum is a chart repository. So, uh, so Monocular can understand anything that understands the, the chart protocol that's specified, but uh, Chart Museum itself is the thing that serves and manages storage and things like that. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, Professor? <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, isn't this a helm? Deep dive? Oh, you're so picky. All right, fine. Does anybody want to talk about Helm 2? Yeah. They, all, they all want to talk about Helm 2. Uh, I tricked them. Yeah. Uh, Helm 2. Let's talk about Helm 2. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we planned that. Uh, so Helm 2 uh, is still considered to be our stable, what you should be running in production release. Uh, and it will be like that for at least a few more months. At least, I should say at least, how many months do I have to buy us in this presentation? Yeah, buy us a little more. At least five years. No, um, so <laughs> Helm 2 is still under active maintenance. And, and that means to us, first, we are actively uh, fixing issues as we find them. There are people who, we, if you tune into the Helm developer call, you will still hear somebody get assigned to triage the issue queue that week. Uh, we keep on top of the issues. We do our best to fix them. Uh, we are still accepting feature requests with a few caveats. So small feature requests that show an immediate benefit to, the, to a large segment of the community, we're definitely considering. Large uh, feature requests that might, um, even, if, even if they're good ones, that might offer some substantial new subset of features, we are kind of like evaluating it to determine whether it would best move on to Helm 3 or if it's going to conflict with something in Helm 3 or whether it is something that would be safe to merge into Helm 2. So, uh, so the best kind of thing to do if you're planning a large feature would be to show up to the dev call on Thursday and say, hey, I got this idea for a feature. How might this fit in with the Helm roadmap? And that might uh, help you avoid a couple of uh, late night coding sessions and disappointment if the PR doesn't get accepted. We have also committed to keeping up with, with Kubernetes. So uh, sometimes, depending on how client Go changes and API machinery changes, I'm going to move a little farther away from Adam in case he violently lashes out. At, uh, you know, Sometimes those APIs change massively, and it takes us a month or six weeks or something to adapt. Other times, like the last time, it was maybe a 40, 50 line patch between the last version of. It was amazing. <laughs> it made Adam very happy. <laughs> Uh, so, but we are doing our best to keep up with that as it goes. The big caveat, though, is with, with Helm 2, none of the core contributors are actively working on new feature development. We have decided to just focus all of our feature development on uh, some other thing. Don't hit me. OK. Uh, have in, did any of you ever use what is now called Helm Classic, or what we never actually called Helm 1? Yeah, OK. So we do, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, some, some people in here I recognize from the Helm yeah, Classic days. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody in here write Helm Classic? Um, with Helm 1, when we set out to do it, there were basically a very small group of us doing it. Uh, Kubernetes was at 1.1 or 1.2 or something like that when we started. And our development process was the team at Deus uh, wrote it in behind closed doors and got it to a particular point and then released it as an open source project. Um, and that, that's a very typical way of starting a new project, right? Then Helm 2 came along, not too much later. And in that case, we had built up enough momentum among some people, some, some teams that we had, uh, you know, three or four people from Google, uh, three people from Bitnami. You know, we were getting, we were gaining contributors from other places and we actually had, you know, meetings and discuss through the features. But still, it was, it was what I would call a closed circle, right? It was mainly just the people who had come in and said, I'm very interested in contributing. This is the degree to which I can contribute. It's not a pull request or two. We didn't publish a roadmap. We didn't write a spec, nothing. Um, and then so Helm 3 was a much different pro uh, process for us. 
Um, we, the, the entire thing was open. It, it was all um, done uh, in the community. And we listened to feedback and um, got input from various sources. Um, you know, we started with the proposal and a bunch of user stories. Um, we collected everything that we had learned fr from doing Helm 2 and aggregated that, um, talked to uh, end users. Um, I'm sure Matt actually flew out to some groups and just listened to like the concerns they had, how they used it. Um, just because we wanted a, a deep understanding as far as, um, um, you know, we have our perception of it, but we're so close to it and the development, we want to know how, the, understand the pain points that people had using Helm and addition, what other pain points that, you know, we might be able to, um, uh, to help them with another version of Helm. Um, so this time we, in, in addition to that, through the process, we make sure to stay transparent through the process. So everything's done on GitHub. Um, nothing's done um, in silo or private repos. Um, we, you can check out the Helm uh, dev v3 branch. Uh, you can download it, uh, check it out, uh, build it. <coughs> the state of that branch will always be buildable and usable. Um, it won't be feature complete, and it's changing very quickly. So I don't recommend using it for anything other than playing with it and, or seeing the direction that we're going. I, I think this has, the, the transparency has actually, I think, been a little jarring for some people because think about how a typical project kind of progresses. You don't, you don't observe the, uh, the, uh, the very early days of a project migration, right? Typically, we start seeing software roll out around the alpha or beta phase. We did the proposal way before we had ever started to write a single line of code. Uh, and people, we, we have actually gotten negative feedback because there's an assumption that something's going on that people don't know about uh, or that we're doing something behind closed doors or that we're intentionally blocking people out or things like that because it is taking us so long to kind of vet out some of these early concepts that we've hit as we go, go through Helm 3. Uh, so it, it's... It's interesting. I mean, in a way, I get kind of this negative feeling that maybe we were too open and we should have just developed prototypes. But then I think, no, the thing was, we wanted the proposal out there long enough for people to be able to comment on it. And then you can see how much time it's taking us to solve some of the fundamental problems like refactoring or trying to figure out how DSLs work or things like that. So just kind of bear with us and give us maybe a slightly larger measure of generosity and understanding as we basically are fighting our way uh, through trying to solve some foundational problems so that then we can really iterate rapidly on re-implementing the things that we broke and then adding the new features we're anxious to add. Yeah, and major version bumps are, are tough for end users. Um, so if, if, if we're going to do this, we want to make sure we do it correctly. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, we have a solid foundation for what we're building on top of. You know, this is something that we don't want to have to do another major version bump for a while for, for end user's sake. You know, Helm has grown to a point that I, I don't think any of us ever imagined. And, um, you know, people at their organizations depend on Helm. Um, Helm is a dependency for other projects. So we, we just want to make sure we do right by everybody, to everybody by, you know, making sure that we, we have the correct approach to what we're doing. Okay, so where we are now. So um, I'm just going to give a quick update as far as where the development is for Helm 3. So how many people have seen this error before? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, Helm 3, um, it will have no tiller. Um, there's a... Uh, and consequently, you will never, yeah. <laughs> we found the bug and we fixed it. Sorry, Tiller. Um, you know, th there's a, a number of advantages to switching to client-only architecture. Um, the, a big and obvious one is security. Um, currently, Tiller is the one responsible for installing um, or creating resources in your cluster that talks to the API. So all resources are created from a single source, no matter which user is um, doing the Helm install. So this will allow 
all resources to be created by the end user who is actually running the command. Um, it will also use the credentials that are for the end user. Um, and so it will enable auditing um, and a, a, another, uh, a few other security advantages too. Um, another thing is just setup. You know, right now you run a Helm init, it sets up some uh, directories in your home directory, and it also uh, installs the uh, tiller deployment in your cluster. Um, with the new architecture, like on CI, all you need is the Helm CLI. You don't have to initialize anything. You don't have to initialize your home directory or, so if you're running local charts, that's all you need. It's just a single dependency. Um, no dependencies on your cluster. Um, and then also the, the error feedback loop. So because it's client server architecture, it's you uh, give the server all the instruction for, I wanna install this thing, and then you just gotta see if it passes or fails. Um, as opposed to if we're client only, then we can actually respond to errors as they happen throughout the process. So we can be a little bit more intelligent as far as how we handle stuff. The great refactor. Um, so gardening is more than just watering flowers. Sometimes you need to do some pruning. I said that. Yeah, that's, that's, from, that's from the professor. That's not from me. Um, so uh, one thing that's just been incredible with Helm 2 is the uh, community contributions. Um, it's, it's been incredible the amount of features that we've had implemented by um, just community people and people using Helm. Um, the disadvantage of that is, you know, everybody's got different styles. Um, everybody has different backgrounds. Um, as you add stuff, uh, if it doesn't quite, naming convention doesn't quite fit, then, well, just create something new and uh, you end up with spaghetti code. Um, because we follow very strict Semver, um, you know, we don't delete stuff. Um, how many of you have gotten PRs with the comment, this breaks backward compatibility on it? It's like my favorite go-to comment. <laughs> You're sick. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're, we're spending a lot of time on the internals and trying to make sure we, we get that correct. Um, this is what majority of the development has been so far, is just going through and cleaning stuff up, looking at naming conventions, um, trying to set stuff up correctly, to make sure we can scale as new features come in. Um, our, our goal is to have the Helm uh, client, have a Helm library that is standalone. So the Helm CLI will essentially be a uh, reference implementation for how you can implement Helm. Um, one thing we've seen is there's a lot of projects now that are integrating with Helm and they want tight integration and they want the same functionality, and sometimes it's bits and pieces, sometimes it's the whole thing. So we're trying to make almost like an SDK style, um, where it's choose your own venture, where if you just wanna do templating, you should be able to do it with the library. If you wanna do um, the whole end-to-end -end, um, chart installation and lifecycle management stuff, you should be able to do that fine. You should be able to look at the CLI as an example for that. The CLI should be responsible for only flag um, and argument processing, and then the library should take care of everything um, past that. Yeah, I, and you can think of it this way. You know, the, the one advantage of having the, the client server model is that the gRPC API was at least intended to provide sort of that canonical API with how you could interact with the piece that did the install and the upgrade. This time around, we're saying, okay, we want a nice, clean library reference. So that if you're writing another Helm tool in Go, you should be able to import a package or two and and be able to get basically exactly the same functionality that the Helm client has without having to copy paste the code back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like for example, you should be able to take the, the CLI and use that as a reference. If you wanted to still have it be an in-cluster component, you should be able to use that same model and make a controller out of it and you know implement it. Um, however your organization needs. Tell us about fun things. Fun things now. So Helm 3 is introducing um, uh, Lua DSLs. Um, so you know, DSLs um, can really help out with um, certain systems with the, the clarity. Um, 
So one concern that I, I keep getting is backwards compatibility and am, am I going to have to rewrite all charts in Lua? Um, the, this is a added feature. Um, templates and everything that has to do with the actual application that you're running is going to be completely backwards compatible. There are some changes to the chart format, but it's all around the metadata behind it. Um, and that's because we've had new features added um, a lot around uh, uh, vendoring charts, uh, chart dependencies um, that we couldn't add to uh, proper places because of our backwards compatibility um, commitment. So now we have that opportunity to make those changes. So because it's only metadata changes, um, that will enable us to have like a preprocessor to be able to convert charts, um, whether it be on the fly, we could probably do like a plugin or something. I don't know. I'm designing stuff as I'm up here. <laughs> um, but, or it could be like a standalone thing where you, you just want to run it on your charts and do it. Like we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out for that. Um, but we want to make sure that there is a story for that. Um, and your existing charts will work fine. Um, so here's an example of what we're thinking. Um, this in it, this uh, on the left here uh, it's, is like when you do a Helm create and it scaffolds out a new chart. This is the, the helper. So what this does is it's a function that you can put in your template that will um, generate a, a name for your resource. Um, it also does validation. It strips out anything that's not valid for Kubernetes. Uh, also truncates it to what Kubernetes will accept. Um, and it's a scary beast. Um, it's not very readable. Go templates are a little difficult to approach if you're not totally familiar with them. They're not completely intuitive. The documentation isn't the greatest on them. There, there's a big learning curve. Um, uh, I don't like writing stuff that looks like that. So on, on the other side here, we have an example of how you could do it in Lua. And this is an example that could go in a, a pre-render hook that's going to calculate these for you automatically and then inject it into your um, values. So then your template ends up looking like just parameter expansion. Um, you essentially just have to dump all the values you want because like any templating and generation happened at the, the previous step. This is just an example way of using it too. Like, um, this isn't like the, the way we're suggesting or anything. This, this is just a use case, um, I want to make clear. But it's, it's definitely a lot cleaner. It's, it's a lot more readable. You can understand it. You can, um, uh, just by glancing at it, you can understand what's happening, at least for me, at least. I don't know this yeah, you weird. actually get syntax highlighting in your editor of choice. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it comes with a lot of advantages. So you want to touch on repositories? Yeah, so uh, chart repositories have gone through a, a very active design cycle, uh, and we're really excited about what's going on. So essentially, uh, a team of people, you know, kind of crossing this boundary between the people who have been working in the charts or uh, side of things and people who are working on the Helm side of things, uh, have been engaged in what weekly meetings for a few months at least now. Wednesday at eight a.m. Uh, eight a.m. Pacific time. 8 a.m. Pacific time, yeah, and it's an ongoing meeting, and I believe it's public, right? Uh, and they've been working through some of these things. Uh, I got to give a shout out because uh, Jimmy is sitting in the front here. Jimmy demoed something. Uh, I think the first demo I saw was at CoreOS Fest a year and a half ago, uh, basically piloting this idea that we could use Helm, uh, that we could use OCI repositories to store Helm charts. And as they've gone through a, a, a fairly decent and in-depth design process and considered a whole bunch of different models, we're basically at that model now. So the current plan is, uh, is to move toward OCI registries like, uh, like Docker's uh, Docker distribution and Docker Hub and, and, the, uh, and Quay. And this will be where we can store charts in the future. It means we're leveraging technologies that already exist that are optimized for the kinds of cloud services that we already want to build. So we're really excited 
uh, that we've kind of that, that we've reached kind of this point where something that Jimmy dreamed up and, and made work a long time ago in one specific way is now going to be generalized and be a way that we can use uh, just Helm out of the box this way. So there's still work to be done, and you guys will probably still be having your Wednesday meetings for for quite a while here as you still go through things. But uh, we're excited that that particular direction has basically been decided at this point, and and we can start executing on it. If there, uh, you guys can add some more when during the QA. If there's anything else you'd like to throw in there about that. Okay. An another thing we're looking at is the release upgrade story. Um, uh, Kubernetes, since we released Helm two, um, has drastically improved the um, uh, apply logic. Um, when we were doing Helm two, um, there was it, it, it was very much specific towards um, individual resources. Um, also, like we as a community didn't fully understand a lot of what what can we actually update? What does it look like? Um, I remember at one of the initial KubeCons, I was like um, talking to Brian Grant, um, and I'm like, well, "What is it supposed to do when you upgrade a resource?" Like I was like, I, I had been working on it for so long, and like trying to, uh, yeah, it was it was a dark time for me. I think it was. <laughs> um, so we, we ended up implementing our own um, diff patching method that very closely followed the apply logic. Um, you know, instead of injecting extra metadata into the resource when it was created in, um, in uh, Kubernetes, we were storing that in the release. So we still had the full uh, thing to, to be able to diff. Um, so in um, Helm 3, we're going to move to a three-way um, diff. Patching, um, Which is basically the, the system that most people use with Kubernetes, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. So a three-way diff means it looks up your live resources as well um, to, to see if there was any changes that were made um, on the fly, um, like using um, uh, cube control and you edit something. Um, before, what we were doing was we were just diffing with the previous version that we had um, in 95 percent of use cases, that works perfectly fine. Um, sometimes things can get a, a little weird in there. Um, so, so we want to move to that, that other architecture. The, the recommendation is still going to be you know, use um, Helm for uh, working with Helm resources. Um, but it, we, we will have that as, um, to be able to reconcile resources if anything does go weird. Um, So uh, another change is around namespaces. So um, Tiller, by default, gets installed into the cube system namespace uh, in Helm 2. And then all state data is stored within that same namespace. So what we've done in Helm 3 is we've changed that to operate a, a lot more like you would expect with deployments. With deployments, when you uh, create a deployment in a specific namespace, it's going to create the pods and um, r replica sets in that same namespace. So we're moving to the same model where um, the metadata, the release metadata, will be stored alongside with the release. Um, it's it's just a, a pattern that is closer with um, the conventions of uh, Kubernetes. Um, so real quick to recap, I just want to fill in like what has already been done. Um, the removing tiller that was the first thing I did because I was super excited about that. Um, I got to delete so many lines of code, which is my favorite pastime. Um, yeah. And this time it was actually didn't hurt anything. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm, yeah, anyway. So, uh, <laughs> um, the namespace change has, has also been done. Um, a lot of the refactoring and cleaning stuff up um, is uh, going to be a, a long process. Like. I have spent a lot of time uh, going through that and cleaning stuff up. Um, so, so if you want to give any of these a try, um, any of these features, feel free to download it and play with it. Um, again, I wouldn't recommend integrating with it because I'm changing stuff very fast in there. And I don't want you to be sad. Uh, yeah, so I mean, to, to kind of summarize all the all the big stuff we're doing on Helm, there are kind of two big categories of things we're trying to do. We've tried to improve the usability of it and realign it with the, the patterns that have emerged in Kubernetes, right? 
the story for upgrade uh, was great for 1.2 and 1.3, but we're way beyond that now, and so that's, that's a major increment. Uh, and, and then the other category is just trying to add sort of strategically the right layer of features to allow, I mean, the, the complexity of applications you all are deploying in Kubernetes now is so far above what it was like when we wrote Helm 2. And so we're trying to do, do our work to kind of catch up on the kinds of features you'll be able to implement in that. Yeah, and just, just the, the knowledge that we all have acquired as a community for doing upgrades. Um, when we were doing the development for initially for Helm 2, like, not a lot of people were in production, so they weren't upgrading stuff. Um, and, you know, we were, um, we had already started treating applications as pets, but, you know, upgrades were still a snowflake. And we were very scared of deleting people's data um, because that makes people sad too, I've heard. Um, so we wanted to be very careful as far as how we handled deployment. So we picked the safest route possible, even though it didn't have all the feature set. Um, but now uh, there's a lot more understanding as far as what can be upgraded as far as resources. Um, a lot of that information has gone into um, the API. So there's validation on stuff like, hey, you probably shouldn't change this. So it's gotten a lot safer now. So now we want to move to implement a lot of those features as well. Uh, so we're hitting a break in the normal schedule at this point, I believe. However, this session was allocated an extra 40 minutes so we could go through some Q&A and, and other talks like that. So uh, if you got to get up and run to a different session, that's totally cool. Thank you very much for being here today, and we hope that you learned a little bit. And then if you're a core maintainer and you're interested in answering questions, you can kind of move back up toward the front of the room. Yes, I saw you back there, Justin. The, the question is, what development work has been done on the, the three-way diffs? Um, and are we re-implementing stuff from uh, cube control, or are we rolling our own? Um, uh, Kubernetes core has recommended against using Kubernetes Kubernetes as uh, a dependency. So we are actively working to remove that as a dependency. So we will have to implement our own until um, server side apply is completed and it will not be completed in the time frame um, that we want to have um, releases out for Helm 3. So that will be something that we'll um, have to wait until another release. Yeah, it, it will mirror very closely what Cube Control does. Oh, yeah, no, I'm. I, I harvest other people's ideas. I don't do my own thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks. So, are we going to see, um, now that we've got three-way diffing, are we going to have some diff safety and stuff like, like a pre-check whether you just change resources under you like that? Uh, yeah, it will enable us for that. Um, oh, sorry. Um, he's asking, um, will it provide any safety checks to, to know um, if you're updating a resource if something had been changed that Helm wasn't expecting? Um, this will enable us to be able to um, generate diffs to be able to, to print out a lot more information um, to, to do dry runs also, which would be nice. Um, I, I didn't understand what you said. I wasn't told that. Should we wait for Q&A or? No, I was there just. There was a break or? I, I was joking? just letting the people who were, who were anxious to get to their next session oh. gracefully stand up and exit. Yeah, it would have been nice to know that ahead of time. Yeah. Come on, man. Same Sorry. team, same yeah. team. Yeah, I'll give you a FIPI later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll sign your FIPI book. When you start using registries, what happens to museums? That's a good question. What, what happens? <laughs> we've, we've got Josh right here. Yes. He's our house expert. He's gonna um, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so he's saying if we move towards using registries um, to store charts, what happens to Chart Museum? And that's very much on the table. Um, I want to focus on 
making sure Helm 3 is a good experience for people and less about Chart Museum's future. So um, it really just depends what direction things go. So. Yeah. Are we going to be able to discover charts in registry? There's a clear search feature. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We're, yes. we're working on a number of those things to make sure that the experience breaks through. There's a whole conversation around converging repositories and charts. So the chart references images. So we want that experience to be the same. And so that's everything from security to discoverability. That was it. That was it. We're done. We're done. Another question? Question over here? So what Jimmy said was yes. Hold on, Matt. Yeah. I do want to. I do want to say though that I'm really impressed that this group that's been designing this has largely put egos aside and said, you know, yeah, I invested a lot of time into this particular Speak idea. For yourself. That, yeah. Except for this is why Adam's not on that team. Uh, no, but that's that's uh, that's a, a laudable thing in any technical group where people get together and say, what is actually the best user experience regardless of the work I've done in the past? Especially as brilliant as us. Okay, I've told that guy he could ask a question like four times now. Okay. <laughs> Um, cu customize is not something I've played with. I've looked into it, but I, it's not something I've played with. So if, if anybody else, any other core people want to take that one? I, I've actually seen several other people do it. Nothing nothing currently in the roadmap for something that would be internal on Helm, well, primarily because we're... Specifically, like, <coughs> Okay, I'm, we designed Helm to be um, uh, as, as flexible as possible if you want to, to wrap tooling around it. Um, we try to limit the, the feature set of Helm, but um, uh, allow you to um, essentially do stuff like that where you could run um, just the templating side of things. You could pipe it to whatever you want. So that's how you could handle your post processing. You could then pipe it to kube control um, so if, if you only want the templating side of things, then you could do it that way. Um, the, the disadvantage of that would be you wouldn't be using Helm for the like, lifecycle management stuff. You wouldn't be doing Helm install and be able to, to manage your releases that way. Um, but the, 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 there could be ways of doing it with tooling around Helm. Yeah, and some of the plugin system in Helm 3 is designed to make yeah, typing parts yeah. of the process out to external tools possible. So yeah, there's, and yeah, you've probably seen Vic Iglesias is one of the chart maintainers. He wrote a blog post about using customize and Helm together. So I, I know of people who are doing it. It's just there's no, there's no opinionated implementation that we have of it or that we're planning on in the Helm three roadmap. Yeah, and, and Helm two had 
um, pluggable backend support. Um, it was developed as like an experimental thing. There was one project that really wanted to use it, um, App, App Controller, I believe. So it, it, they wanted to be able to have um, some orchestration that happened afterwards. So it's the same step that, that you're talking about. Um, adoption was just very low. Um, interest um, wasn't really there for, for that. After we had developed it, it stayed in experimental. So um, we kind of phased it out. But yeah, the plugin system, um, you, you, that would be the place to start looking. I think some hands were up over here before. I, did you have a question? I'll, I'll, I'll get back to over there. Can I start test driving Helm 3 alongside Helm 2, or do I need to? Yes. Yes, I do it all the time. Even for development, I'll install stuff using Helm 2, and then I'll switch to Helm 3. It's very confusing for me sometimes, because sometimes I generate the same executable, and I get confused. But um, right now, the backend storage is exactly the same. So That you, will change, though. That will change. Again, like I said, you can play with Helm 3. but um, So you could actually install Helm 2 resources. I, I don't recommend it. but um, And then you could list them with Helm 3. So the, the storage layer is exactly the same right now. Not in production. Just have to say that. Thank you. If, if we had lawyers, they would have insisted that I say that. <laughs> yeah, another question? Registry people? What? Anybody want to take that? So the, the question was, is there any docs on using any of the repository stuff yet with existing uh, registries, right? Um, so app registry is the POC for all this stuff. That has been integrated with Quay, and you can use that today in Quay. And a bunch of people use that in production. It's not exactly what it will end up being for Helm. Um, but that is a plugin that you can use for Helm V2 right now today. Um, but yeah, I, I, you, there's still no docs on doing any of this stuff outside of app registry. Um, we, we still have to work with the standards body to actually get uh, the final implementation details basically decided, the specification written, and then we'll have some generic tooling around doing that. Yeah. And we, working with Josh, we implemented Helm charts in Azure Container Registry. And that's like the beginning of what we've been trying to get this working so it's not unique to a particular registry. So with ACR, we do support Helm charts now. And we want to make it a more standard thing so that it works across all of them. That's oh, there it is. Hi. Uh, uh, I just walked in. Hi, I'm Afrina. So I guess the talk is. <laughs> Sounds great. I'm great at delegating. I'm going to delegate them to Matt. Uh, so there's also uh, one of the CNCF projects called Harbor, which like uh, Azure Container Registry and these others, it can also store Helm charts. It's something you can run on your own. It's a CNCF project. It's basically a coupling of things, I think, like Docker distribution and Chart Museum, which is a Helm project, and a number of things to give you image storing. It's got Claire built in for scanning, but it also uh, has Chart Museum for chart storage, which will work for now. But the OCI-based systems and Docker distribution stuff is probably months away as we work through the chain of events to make it happen. Yeah, question. Um, so what's the, what's the current story with um, relation to like secrets and Helm, like putting, putting secrets into charts or um, you know, storing them? Does that make sense? You're looking at me funny. I don't know if uh, I'm making sense. I'm computing, computing. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, anybody want to? Let me further ask. When you say secrets, do you mean actually having it as a, um, an object within a chart that you could say, you know, have a secret in there and then have it coupled to, say, a deployment and you've mounted characteristics in there? Or do you mean like Helm storing its data in secrets? Uh, encrypting secrets and having Helm um, decrypt them on install, like like what like the, what the Helm Secrets project does. So like the Helm Secret project, okay, or SAS, okay.
Well, I mean, I, because I, there are several different routes that people will be able to go, and some of them are there are secrets management tools that are actually getting very good inside of Kubernetes. Um, I know many people who are using variations of those tools. I, I don't think we're supposed to tell people about it, though. Oh, since it's not Helm? It's a secret. Yeah, pain, oh. <laughs> I walked into that one. I'll be here all day, folks. If I had a fippy to throw at you, I would. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I'm kind of optimistically hopeful about doing the Lua stuff is that uh, if we if we can provide a good crypto library for Lua, and there are how many how many Lua libraries do crypto? Brian assures me the Lua expert in the room assures me that there are lots and lots of Lua libraries. It would enable people to write. Uh, the kind of Helm specific libraries that I think would be necessary to do that if we wanted to do it as a primitive inside of Helm, but without writing it straight into the Go code and consequently locking everybody into using AES 256 or writing an entire crypto library that's exposed in templates. So that is one option. We're not, uh, that's me hedging before I say we're not actually trying to solve it as a first class solution inside of Helm. Yeah, I'm going to cut in line too before the other, one of the other maths takes over again. Um, <laughs> So we try to be as non-opinionated as possible when um, dealing with your specific application. So uh, however you want to implement the, the secrets thing, we, we want to facilitate that, where we don't want to force people into a specific way of handling um, anything around their application. Is that what you're going to say? Well, I was going to say something like that. Like, imagine how many people are in the room. Now, each of you probably has at least one workflow you'd like to do, and many of them are not going to overlap. So how can we not get in the way of that, right? And you know, some folks are going to want to use SOC. Some folks will want to use you know, KMS. Some folks may even want to get into backing secrets with their key management service, which is a new thing coming in Kubernetes, right? Uh, there's lots of things going on and workflows, and so we don't want to be in the way. But yet, yeah, we still want to enable you to do that. And I'm actually hoping the event system will let me have plugins to plug in to do what like Helm Secret does, and yet make it a little bit more transparent, or maybe include something in Lua uh, to figure out those workflows. Right now, for example, on the hub, we have to store the secrets and solve this problem. And so we've had to work through those same kinds of struggles. And we'd like a better workflow. So hopefully, we can get in Helm 3, but without being too opinionated. All right, I think there was hands over here. Who, who are you referring to, Matt? Butcher? Who are you referring uh, to? Got a couple of questions. So I'm a chart maintainer. Don't hurt me. Um, what are you we doing you. to make the lives of chart maintainers easier? I have a suggestion. But I, I, I like tried to get that. you cuddles, but I told it was <laughs> inappropriate. <laughs> um, yeah, anyways, something that could make it easier would be, um, I mean, uh, better access to CI. So. In the chart that I maintain, there are so many options, and uh, get lots of pull requests. And pull requests can break other things. If I had a better test, a better way to test my charts, that would be great. I mean, I could use my own infrastructure for testing, but I'm not super invested in that either. Like I know there's Prow, but it only tests like the no values, no additional values. It'd be cool if I could just have here's a bunch of test cases. And All right, Farina just got giddy. So all right, let's go. Have you heard of the chart testing project that's a Helm project? No. It, it's, it's at github.com slash helm slash chart dash testing, and it's designed to help you test your charts. In fact, we even have a way where you can have varying different values files, and it can walk through installing and testing each one. It's there today. We also have things like static analysis that'll even look at schemas for like your chart YAML file, make sure you're following them right. It, it goes way beyond Helm Lint. And it's one of the tools we use. We actually use it on the stable and incubator repositories today. So it's run constantly. Chart dash testing. Oh, it was written by, so we had the Chopwood Carry Water Award the other day. And the gentleman who, who won that award, Reinhard, uh, he's one of our maintainers. He actually wrote that. We're focusing on this side right now, so. Right up front. Good job. So uh, with, with the introduction of the Lua hooks in Helm 3, uh, 
what would you say that the, the limits of the functionality you would in good conscience encourage someone to implement in one of those Lua hooks? You know, like I could stick an HTTP server in there if I wanted, but like that's probably a bad plan. Um, and I'm asking because I'm interested in what you see as the limit of people doing with orchestration in those hooks. Like, would you see someone doing something like a canary release as part of a Lua hook in a chart? What are you building? <laughs> no, well, I'm, I'm building a system to do canary rollouts with Helm charts, and I was kind of wondering like how this is going to play with uh, Helm 3. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'll feed off of you and say don't mine cryptocurrency in there. Uh, but so so do does any how many you may have talked about this before I got here. How many people know that there are Helm charts out there to install OpenStack into into a Kubernetes cluster? Did you know that? Yes. There are Helm charts out there. And we have some very, very ugly features inside of Helm that you will not yeah, find anybody him. implementing on GitHub, <laughs> right, or in public, and I will not tell you what they are because I don't know how they work. They're there to uh, enable some of this. And so I would expect those super complicated applications that weren't necessarily built to be in containers have some really ugly things you have to do. And Lua is a great place to do that where we don't have to modify Helm for those special cases. And those crazy applications will push those limits. At least that's what I'm hoping. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to provide an extra tool for the, you're trying to do something way out of the box and are trying to beat this round peg in a square hole and um, you just need something to work as, as, as a fix for something that your org has required. So, so it's made for a safety net for that as well as just cleaning up um, some of the Go template stuff. Did, are you leaning forward in your chair because you want the mic? No, what? Um, I guess as far as um, the, the standard library that you'll have access to within Helm, um, we haven't, uh, like, I mean, other than crypto, we, we don't see that there will be like an HTTP, but it, it'll be probably community driven, like what people need. Yeah, yeah, we're still unsure on, you know, what's the requirement going to be? Are, are we going to allow access to like file path stuff? Or, you know, because client side, like, you know, we just want to make sure that. You know, we restrict stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, don't worry. But, but what I'm saying is like, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the nice things about Lua is that we can pick which of the standard libraries yep. we want to yep. expose and which we don't. We can also, you know, if we end up supporting Lua plugins specifically, we can have charts that run with one set of libraries and plugins that run with it. We have a lot of options that, uh, that we otherwise would not have had. Uh, please don't write a web server in a <laughs> Yeah, I, black shirt. Well, I, I prom yeah. Uh, so, look, look, looking ahead when, you know, V3 is finished, yay, um, and we roll it out. Um, and on day one, sort of, you know, people are upgrade, upgrade to it, all their charts are still in the V2 format, the original format, um, and we expect it to, in general, work, of course. I, I know, we, you know we've always heard that the chart format is, not gonna, is gonna be com compatible, but I'm thinking more about the operational impact of going to V3. Like, I know customers, for instance, who, for instance, um, the fact that all the releases are in the system, in the main namespace, they can look at them all and say, ah, oh, I can tell you what, I can you know, sum up what's released. Well, suddenly they're all going to be in the individual namespaces, for instance. So can you talk about what the impact you think might be at that upgrade point before you've used any V3 features, but people want it to just work and be comfortable as they upgrade? What kind of in, you know, problems might people encounter, do you think? Um, it, it's a... Um most likely, you would need to just do a fresh install um, if you want those resources managed. Um, because we're changing the storage layer, um, it's going to be um, uh, 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 that's going to be a, a breaking change. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to um, or support Helm three talking to Helm two uh, releases. Um, I'm not sure if we want that tech debt going into a um, major version bump. Okay. So, Adam? Yes. You know, this would actually be a great opportunity for somebody to write a Helm plugin that upgrades all your resources from V2 to V3 ones. Two to three. Two to three. <laughs> would be a great Helm plugin. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not saying a definite no that it won't be possible, but um, I, the, the truth of it is right now, I, I don't know. So I had a follow-up to the uh, what can you do with Lua question, and this is more of a, I guess, a specific practical thing that I was, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, oh, great, maybe that's a way for me to pull an output from a Terraform 
deployment so that I can inject a value into a Helm chart because it was you know something that was done via Terraform. Um, but then that would be you know talking to an external system or something like that. Do you think that that's a potential use of the Lua story? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that goes along with the same discussion around what we want to enable in that. Um, it, it would definitely um, uh, allow for some security holes that I think would be a big concern if we allow um, speaking to external services. Um, uh, yeah, if, if you have a specific use case like that, um, you know, if, if you want to bring it up with any of the core people or drop an issue in, um, the, the proposal, I, I don't know if we mentioned this, but the, the proposal is hosted under Helm slash community in there. Um, you can open issues on that um, with any concerns you have with the proposal, that, that would be a good one. Um, we definitely love to hear use cases. Um, you know, we want to make sure we, we build the right thing for people, so um, that, that would be the place to include something like that. All right, so, so let me jump on two things here. Um, first, the, the Helm specific one is part of it we're talking about workflow, right? And so a, a chart is a self-contained package you can pass around and can be implement, you know, installed into one or more clusters, right? And so I don't know if you're thinking that Terraform gets coupled with a package and is called, now you've got external dependencies that you're trying to ship around. That might get a little complicated. Some of this sounds like it's uh, a way to have a chart that needs a value that's maybe credentials to connect to a database. And in that case, it might be a plugin that is able to call it to Terraform to do this. And then the plugin is able to inject those values and using Lua in that way. And I'm hoping something like the event system will give us access to look at Terraform from a workflow way <laughs> rather than a package, you know, part of the actual chart package. But the other thing, as, as you probably heard some whisperings over here, uh, and it came up in the SIG apps deep dive earlier, is CNAB. Are you familiar with that? The cloud native application bundles, cnab.io. Uh, it's designed to be able to tie some of these things together in an installable package, and that may give you a more short-term solution for it, although it is very early alpha. Yeah, and there's a lot of overlap between the Helm crew and the CNAB crew, so you know it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> my, my question is about uh, Helm 3.0. So what is your recommendation for someone who is just about to use Helm? Is it, is it better to wait for Helm 3.0 yeah, or use it just like a client with some template? So uh, recommendation right now is still to use Helm 2. Um, and uh, it, we're still um, a f probably a few months out from even having an alpha, so the, the suggested version is still two. Uh, I have a couple questions, one related to the Lua uh, and scripting and patching, and the other one related to GitOps. Um, so, I mean, first lead-up question to the Lua one, do you plan on supporting any sort of patching in Lua, like patching any part of the charts, or is it, or is it just kind of pre, pre-processing? Um, well, the, the Lua provides hooks at various points. Um, uh, in the process, one would be loading, um, another would be like um, pre-render, um, post-render. So, the the actual re resources that you're working with, um, I don't think you would want to do diffing there. Um, I suppose you could. You have access to the objects, so you could you know, do whatever you want with the objects if you wanted to. Um, uh, what, what, what is um, your use case for that? Uh, the, re the reason is, so this kind of ties into the, the patch question that was asked earlier. Like, um, I think one of the issues that I run into is that you're kind of limited 
with what you can change based on what the maintainer of the chart exposes. And now th th there's like a lot of work that the chart maintainer has to do to figure out, okay, what should I expose? And then like someone wants to change this, oh, I need to expose this. Like I, it might be better because it's a little different than NPM where NPM is like, okay, I'm, there's some business logic that I'm using. Like yes. Helm, it's like your, it's YAML files. And so there's a lot of different things that people would want to change. So yeah. maybe so by default having something that could support that sort of customizability. I'm yeah, curious so what so you think about that. For what you're talking about, you can do. There, there's a post-render step, so what you're working with is the actual rendered resources, and you can do whatever you want with them at that point. You can edit values, you can throw conditionals saying, like, if uh, there's this condition that got thrown in from my original values, then go in and swap out all the labels with the, the, my corporate policy of resources that cr get created. So you will have access to dependent um, uh, resources. And, and, and will that be a problem when uh, kind of extending charts? Because in, in, inheritance is kind of one of the big, bigger issues that I, I personally run into right now, if other people run into. Um, you could run into problems, depending on what you're doing. Um, but without knowing your specific use case and what you're changing, it would be extremely hard for me to give you an answer to that. Um, and then well, we're definitely giving you a powerful tool set, and you can shoot your foot off many ways with a powerful <laughs> tool set. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, you'll be able to get yourself in trouble changing stuff. Um, we're not going to limit it. We're, we're leaving a lot of the responsibility up to um, the people using the tools. Okay, cool, thanks. And then um, the one related to GitOps was in, in Helm 3, uh, you're going to be creating CRDs to manage releases and whatnot. And uh, one of the patterns that's emerging is like, okay, I'm going to push my infrastructure to a Git repository and then have some like operator or something scan that Git repository and, and reconcile the state. Um, is Tom going to support uh, something like that, where where it's like, oh, I, I'm, I'm instead of actually committing it to the repo, I'm going to just like output the CRDs and all the, or all the resources somewhere. Well, um, Helm stores uh, state in snapshots. So you're not actually going to be upgrading uh, the stored state. Instead, it just creates a new one. So uh, you shouldn't um, have that issue where you're just going to create a, a new one on top. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. So are you talking things like the WeaveWorks, Helm Operator kind of style of things? Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, I, I don't know that we are thinking about building that ourselves but others are more than welcome because there's many different possible operator GitOps types of workflows and variations that people may want to do. Um, for example, how many clusters are you running? How many different configs do you have for those clusters? How do you scale that out? And I, I know we're talking about an operator model. I don't know if you talked about that. Do you want to talk? Okay. Yeah, and, and so I know Weave is, we're, we're, I think you know they want to contribute it, so we don't want to get in the way. Yeah, we're, we're, right. we're working. Yeah, help, but so, but yes, some of this is in thought, and Weave has been working on the GitOps model with Helm, and I would hope as Helm three comes along, they continue to do that. Does that help? Yeah, we have a relationship going with them, and um, we're, we're getting their input on specific things, and we're, we're trying to see um, where they can, uh, where they want to contribute. As well. I get to pick the next person. Delegation. I should really pay attention. What did you? Thank you. Uh, I've got a use case question. So, in Helm two, you have support for chart dependencies. Obviously, you can do composability, but it's pretty limited. Like you can only have one version of a chart dependency. Let's say you've got two microservices, and they both depend on different. Uh, versions of the Postgres chart can't do that. So um, how how important is composability to, to Helm 3 and being able to support that correctly? But I guess the bigger use case I have is like we have an organization that deploys microservices. Each of them gets deployed individually, um, but I want to be able to uh, create a mega chart that composes a constellation of services um, for integration testing so I can easily spin up an integration test that just has a subset of my company's stuff. Can I take that one? Yeah, so that is one of the things that is one of, that we are actively trying to solve various issues in composability 
uh, in the way that the Lua engine is going to work, um, in the way that we, if you look at the proposal, we have tried to figure out a way there to provide library style charts that you would be able to load in and increase the, the uh, reusability of charts that don't necessarily create new resources. All of this stuff is very experimental at this point because it's going to depend on uh, the changes that we can make in the implementation of the engine. It would be great to capture any kind of use case like you have for that in an issue, even on, so the, uh, we didn't put a slide up here that showed where the proposal is. Um, I assume. I, I think that was your part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, at helm slash community, there's the, the full proposal is in there, and that's a good place to, we have a running set of use cases in there. That's a great place to put something like that so that we can, you know, it's in the right context for the people who are considering what the proposal, how the proposal needs to be uh, uh, modified. Uh, one thought on that, if you want to do that today, uh, you can use something like Armada or Landscaper or Helm file, and that kind of is a layer that will sit on top of Helm, and you can say, grab these charts, install them with this configuration, and you can do that today for your testing environment. And if you go to docs.helm.sh slash related, you can read about those different projects. Yeah, at the Helm Summit, there were talks on it. And those videos are on YouTube, youtube.com slash C slash Helm Pack. You got all the addresses down. Yeah. I don't remember where I live. When we migrated our services from resources created using kubectl apply to Helm, uh, one of the challenges was uh, the service resource. Um, uh, the problem with there was you could either delete it and then have Helm recreate it, which would cause a outage or create it with a new name and then have to update all the clients in your cluster. Um, so that sort of related to the Helm 2 to Helm 3 upgrade. So if there's no way to sort of upgrade in place, is there will there be a way to sort of take over existing resources? Uh, so uh, I'll at least jump on the, the service part because I think the Helm 2 to Helm 3 is something that needs more talk. Do we don't have an answer for today? Um, uh, yeah, and if you want to be part of that conversation, um, you know, definitely join, join the call or join the conversation on uh, GitHub. You, you know, this is very much, we're just out of initial proposal stage, so there still is a lot of stuff to, to be figured out. Um, it, it, that would be one of them. And if you want to know uh, our meeting schedule, if you go to the Helm, you know, github.com slash Helm slash community, there is now a link up there to the calendar and even an ICS file you can subscribe to. So, you know, when the meetings are with the Zoom information and all that stuff, if you're interested in coming to be part of that. Uh, I would also say that with uh, services and that changing, you're right, you, you can end up in things like trying to tie external DNS into it to try and give DNS names and point things. One of the easier things that I found is actually put ingress in front of it because then you can swap out your things and still keep the same ingress if you install an ingress control in your cluster. That's the quick and dirty way today is to use an ingress control like Nginx ingress. And then when you change things, it still points to the same records. Nginx ingress will stop writing it from the one and then to the new. Oh, that's the one you're looking at. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having some good stories about, because a lot of people have Helm 2 things installed in production and the, a seamless upgrade to, to move to Helm 3. It, maybe Helm 3 can go and extract the release information from Helm 2. Or there's different, there's different way, or you can, you can install, but just kind of take, if the thing is already there, just take it over. And, and so having some stories there I think would be good. Um, that's it. Just write a quick issue. So, so I have a question here uh, to follow up on that. And, and since we've got a room of people here, uh, Helm has the ability to have plugins, right? Because this is a, like a one-time upgrade task. Would this be something better that's part of a plugin that is the Helm upgrade plugin, where you can grab that and run an upgrade, and then all of a sudden all your stuff is moved to Helm 3? Or from a user experience, do you think it would be better if it was just baked into Helm 3 itself? And you know, we'll have to carry the code weight and all of that for the life of it. What do you, what do you all think? For me, if it was just like a one-time, these are bulletproof steps you can run, and if you're, you're installed in Helm 2, and you run these steps, and voila, now you're, everything you have, your releases are all now 
Helm 3 releases. Maybe you can't roll back to Helm 2. Maybe that's a, an acceptable you know, caveat. You know? um, and maybe Helm 3 is not going to save the last five of your releases that were Helm 2 releases. But having some, having some steps would be good enough for me. And I think that would be better than trying to put lots of logic in Helm 3 that's only for this one-time deal. I was, th I was th thinking design work for this already. No, I was. <laughs> um, I'd li I'd like to collaborate um, on a project like an actual Helm two to three plugin um, that would that would basically look at your Helm two releases, keep them running, and then push them into Helm. Th What's going on? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, don't forget to assign it to him. Hey, you need to. Uh, under assignees, put Josh's name there. Oh, shoot. I don't have org maintainer for <laughs> what? It's in the text, at least. Hold on. Give me. <laughs> I'll do it in a minute. So I will just say, like, HEM2 to HEM3, there not there a big architectural change like Tiller is going? For example, I will always prefer to do, a, like, a, a migration, like, converting all my HEM2 to HEM3. I will never want to go with a plugin. I will be so scared to go for that. <laughs> Because there will be a big architectural change. Am I missing the point? Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah. You could have a tool. The first step could be a dry run. You actually run to make sure everything goes. And maybe the, the next step is a backup, where we can grab a backup of all of those things into a directory that you could redeploy after the fact if you screw it up. Because you know if you're going to do an upgrade, you always want to do a backup first, right? Maybe you can grab this and stick it into another cluster and create a backup and mirror so you can actually try and see whether your upgrade works. And not everybody's going to do all of these. And then finally, there's the actual do it. But if we go through and have a lot of these steps and talk about through it, we can do things in ways that people with different levels of safety can feel safe about it. At least that's the kind of things yeah. that I would like. Real quick, just a comment on like all this discussion that's going on. First of all, thank you for bringing this up and addressing it because it's it's made it really clear to, to me at least like what the concerns are with the the migration story. Um, so thank you for addressing that, and like we will definitely figure something out, you know, like whether it be a tool, like, you know, let's kick off a discussion and let's, let's start figuring out what is the best approach for this. And th this is what I was referring to earlier about how we love use cases because it's extremely helpful to, to hear like in, in production what your requirements are for moving forward with this because we want to make sure that, that there is a, a clean path for all this. So um, we should definitely have like a something in the community docs. Whoa. So I have um, everybody started laughing. I lost my train of thought now. Thanks, thanks, Josh. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we have two minutes. I think. Okay, uh, I have one question. Um, have you planned something about validation? I see a lot of space of charts that people reuse and so, and sometimes. Uh, in the year on charts are very unclever things. Sorry, and have you, have quick, you some you uh, validation? Michelle was talking, so uh, I, I, I missed I what you're uh, asking. Have you add a, a layer to validation or are you all your um, um, manifest and so or governance and so? Have you planned uh, anything in, about this plan? So we have Hamlin today, but we have this project we talked about a little while ago, chart testing. And one of the things we want to do is add that validation to it. We just, uh, so chart testing was originally written as this super complicated set of bash scripts with functions and all this stuff. And we said, wow, we are doing way too much in bash. So before we started adding any of these bash things. Hater. I don't hate bash, but there's some times where it becomes too hard to deal with when you've got too many lines of it. At least for us mere mortals, maybe not for you. 
Uh, and so it was sometimes. recently rewritten in Go, so we can continue to extend it. But that's one of the things we want. And if we don't get to it quick enough, we are very happy to have a contribution of something that does. We'll even give guidance on it. So if it's something you'd like to contribute, please come let us know. And we are happy to point to the way so we can get to it more quickly with your help. Uh, we actually have till 5.05, oh, so we have six more minutes. I just checked the schedule. I don't know, Michelle might be out of battery by then. Um. <laughs> I'm just curious where the uh, application CRD fits in all this, if that's going to be part of the thing. Application CRD, uh, is that going to be part of it? Uh, anybody want to take that? What was the question? Application CRD. I don't think that is a question. That is just a word. Uh, when, uh, what are we going to do with it in Helm 3? Yeah, I should probably answer this. So I'm one of the maintainers of application CRD, so I wanted to punt to see whether they would do it. Uh, I don't want to touch that. Yeah, you don't, nobody wants to. Uh, so application CRD is not fully baked yet, and we should not support it as a... It, you can install it along with any other thing in Helm, right? Any other CRD-based thing, and we're working to improve on that stuff, even in Helm 2. Uh, there's a proposal in writing for it Where? that's coming. Uh, I talked to the person, then it's out there somewhere. Okay. Uh, he, he found me at the conference. And so uh, you can install it like anything else today. As far as treating it as something special, uh, I'm going to hold to it that we need to have that out and GA and stable before we do that. And it has not been moving at the speed we'd hoped, and so we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, but right now, a beta was released. And, and it's kind of sitting there waiting. And the person who's been primarily driving it, uh, he is busy for the next month or so, uh, and probably is gonna be swamped when he comes back. So it's just, we need some more contributions to the app CRD. And if somebody wants to come help with that, we can help get you going. We are very happy to do that. But let's wait for that to be fully baked and then have the conversation. Last, no, another upgrade question. Um, is it already part, is it, has it been part of the Helm 3 kind of conversation, like the features and requirements um, to change, like if an upgrade fails, to make it, to, to, to roll back or to change the behavior of when an upgrade fails? Right now when an upgrade fails, it's just the st everything that was done up to that point is there. Helm doesn't know about it. And some of those things, if they're new things, you have to go and kind of clean up by hand. Yeah, you're asking difficult questions now. Um, <laughs> so, so. So uh, the issue is if uh, something fails along the way while it's being deployed, Helm itself doesn't know what the actual issue was. It could be a whole number of things. Um, being able to reconcile when doing a deployment with a three-way diff is definitely going to help with that. But at some level, you can't completely depend on a tool like Helm to know what to do in every situation when your application fails during a deployment. So at at some level, there's always going to be human interaction. Um, unless we become extremely opinionated about your application that you can install, um, which is something that we don't want to do. Um, it, it's just the nature of running upgrades on stuff in the cloud. Like We're trying to get um, a lot better about it, and that's why we're switching to the um, being able to reconcile what's actually in the cluster and not just what we assume is in the cluster or what we last um, put into the cluster. Um, so it, it's a huge step forward, but it, it's, it's still not going to be perfect. So, so one thing that we we have, um, it's, it's in Helm 2, is Helm test. And that is, um, it will run um, after an install or um, at any point. And within that, you can actually put whatever you want. It, you can do all your checks. So if there's certain um, fail conditions that your application is prone to, uh, you can run checks against that, and you can actually program um, however you want. It just, it's just a pod that's running um, to be able to, to uh, uh, reconcile that.
Yeah, Helm is not going to fix distributed computing. <laughs> um, my question was my about, looks. like, uh, with the dry run, is mm -hmm. there going to be a way to possibly either target the dry run or target and install afterwards so that you would only upgrade certain resources? Because, like, maybe you'll notice that part of what's going to change is good with you, but other things, you know, could be dangerous. Uh, um, I would not recommend doing that. I'm, I'm not, I don't understand your use case, but if... If something about an installation is bad and you don't like it, then um, uh, I would recommend uh, fixing your installation. Okay, and then real quickly too, is there anything about pri priority on dependencies, so like the order that things will load? I know that's an issue with operators, for instance, right now. Um, talk about what? How we load dependencies. Well, is it? Is it uh, like dependent charts, or is it uh, creating resources in Kubernetes? It can be either way. Like for instance, you know, there's a two-step install right now. If you want to create a custom CRD, and then well, well, is it um, you, you want? There you go. <laughs> uh, both. I guess one use case is I have a chart that I wrap. A chart a Prometheus in, so it runs an operator first and then it runs the other and kind of just does that with a flag. It would be nice if that could just all happen in one run. And then other use cases would be like somebody was talking about having a single chart to manage, you know, a bunch of different charts to build their whole application stack. And for that, you know, there's order that has to happen in a lot of cases, and that's just not something that's possible in Helm right now. Oh, you're talking about like orchestration for. Um Yeah, and um, like the, I know this was looked at by a lot of the OpenStack stuff as well. Um, we, it, it, it is not a goal of Helm to be um, in the orchestration business. Um, we we want to focus on uh, doing a few things right and. Um, the things that we are doing most right, I think, are the chart package and templating. So I think that's what we want to remain as our focus. Um, orchestration can happen around Helm, um, but we do not um, really want to open that can of worms of creating too big of a system for Helm itself. Okay, we're, we're, I think we're over time too, so do, does anybody have a burning desire or want to give compliments? We'll accept that as well. Adam, I like your hair. Thank you. You're welcome. Shout out to Antoine. Oh, I don't know. Well, Antoine! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! Yeah. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Adam.